This is Channel 7, the number one station for news and information in Southern California. It's estimated that here in the United States, there are over two million members of the Hare Krishna movement. Tonight, Dr. William Rader begins a special three-part report on the Krishnas and, most importantly, the first generation of children born into the movement. Bill? Thank you, Jerry. The International Society for Krishna Consciousness is a fundamentalist sect that has become perhaps the most visible and therefore controversial New Age religion in the West. Recently, however, there's been a growing concern surrounding the first generation of Krishna children who are born into the movement, many of whom are raised separate from the rest of society. We visited the commune-like -like community in the Sequoia Mountains to take a look at the children of Krishna. Dwarkanath joined the Krishna movement 11 years ago and works as the headmaster of the commune-like community that teaches and raises the first generation of Hari Krishna children. His wife, Krishna Preya, teaches them reading, writing, and arithmetic, in addition to Sanskrit philosophy and scripture studies. They have three children and now a grandchild who are all born into the movement. Together, the three generations of Krishna followers work toward Krishna consciousness. I think my family is most important, but it's, it's hard to separate that from my life in Krishna consciousness because they're so intermingled. And uh, I guess ultimately if someone were completely pure in heart in their love for God, they say the first thing in my life is God. So I guess I could say that in one sense because I don't think I would be happy with my family if we weren't all t working together towards God consciousness. My role, because I'm married, is that I have the children and I take care of them and I always try to keep them Krishna conscious, um, taking care of the household duties, cooking, laundry, seeing that everything that he needs is there for taking care of his body and um, and also maintain my own spiritual life too because I have to maintain that so that I can maintain them nicely. From the time I was a teenager I had a sense of searching, searching for something, for a higher pleasure, a higher happiness. Before I was working in a certain type of consciousness and now I'm working in a different type of consciousness, I'm working for God. So. It, that higher pleasure I have found. How do you feel about being betrothed to your parents deciding who you're going to marry when you're 13 years old? Well, they didn't decide for me. I decided for myself. He wanted to marry me. He asked my father. Then my father asked me. And I said no. And then I, I saw him. I was watching him before. I never really noticed him in the temple. And I saw him. And then... I became attracted to him, and I decided that I would marry him. What are your plans for your daughter? I'm going, I'm going to raise her in Krishna consciousness, just like I was raised in Krishna consciousness. And I want only the best for her, just like I, my parents wanted the best for me. And I'm not saying that she has to do everything like I do. She doesn't have to be betrothed when she's 13. She's an individual, and she has her own desires. She might not want to be married until she's 25 for that matter, you know? so that's up to her. It's not that there's a pattern and everyone must follow it. Everyone's an individual and decides for themselves. This is Sada Rupa, who's a successful model. You've been on the cover of Vogue, and you've been a member of the Krishna movement for eight years. She said that she was betrothed when she was 13, married at 15. Is, it sounds unusual. Is it unusual for your movement? It is a very unusual thing, yes. I have been traveling and working in most of our temples in Europe, India, and America, and it has only been uh, a fact two times in the eight years that I have been in Krishna consciousness. Okay, do you mind, Christian Jerry, ask you some questions? Of course. I'm wondering uh, about the children who are raised as Krishnas. Uh, it would seem to be a completely different education than our children yet whether they go to parochial schools or whether they go to public schools it would seem to be kind of a closed society and isolationism and I'm wondering how does that fit with an open society like ours our children are allowed to uh, express themselves the way that they feel they want to express themselves now we teach our children the highest moral standard and every mother I think you will agree with me uh, is prepared to do the best for her child as she sees uh, what is best. But I think what Jerry is saying 
is that in some of the situations, the children are not exposed to as many things as the children outside. They're not educated as our children are. They're not exposed to the things that our children are. They're kind of, they're kind of clustered, aren't they? They may not be exposed to violence and guns in school, drugs, uh, so many horrible things that I think most parents won't like their children to be exposed to, but they are exposed to all kinds of natural things. We have academic programs fully on the line of normal children's programs. We have uh, very loving and sweet relationships with our children between the, the two, and that uh, makes that the children are having a behavior which is actually very, very wonderful. I would like to invite you to come and, and visit our school yourself and you will see how everyone is very, very happy. Will you be back over with someone? There'll be other family members. I we ran out of time and I need to go and I regret it very, very much. There's more to pursue. Yeah. We'll try to do that as the week goes on. Thank you very much indeed. Dr. William Rader joins us now. He talks to a 17-year-old who became a member of the Krishna movement and was raised in it since he was eight years of age. Bill? Thank you, Jerry. There's been a recent trend among teenagers to become involved in new religious movements. Many of them are involved to a much greater extent than their parents are with their traditional religious affiliations. One of the most popular groups is the Hare Krishnas, and now we're seeing the first generation of Krishna children, children who are born into the movement or brought into it at a very early age. We visited the Mandir Temple here in Los Angeles and spoke with Raghunath, who's been a Krishna member since he was a child. I asked him how he felt he was different from the other 17-year-old boys. I have to say, I chant Hare Krishna, and I follow the program that's here in the temple. Other people, they may love God. Some boys, I'm sure they follow some morals and principles. I'm sure that there's some children watching that are very happy. The difference is that I'm giving my life to this, and somebody else has given his life to something else. I work from about 9.30 to 1.30. And at 1.30, we, I go with the rest of the men, with some men that stay back at the temple, you know, cleaning up and uh, preparing the food for the rest of the members that have gone out. We go out around 1.30 and do Harinam in the streets. Which is uh, when we take our cymbals and our drums and we go out into the streets and dance and chant. I also find it interesting to see, to hear how other people think about us and see us. And there's so many different ways. So many, so many people have so many opinions about us. But then, after speaking with us some time, it's really amazing. They sort of, they walk away with a smile. It makes sense to them. What about your sexuality? What's your sexuality? Uh, I'm celibate. I'm a bachelor. I don't engage in is that okay? Yes. <laughs> it's good for me. Um, we can understand... It's taught in, in the Vedas that celibacy uh, is very healthy and makes one very strong. And he can, he's more adept to understand spiritual knowledge. To a certain extent, everyone has to control it. There's so many nice women walking down the sidewalk, you can't go, out, go after every single one of them. I think I could function very, very well in a normal society. So you become a better person. I don't know how to explain it. You become more personal. You don't treat everyone with a, a distant attitude. You become more friendly. That's, it. That's what comes from following these different principles. You don't become, how should I say, so hard. You can relate with people, and that's one of the most important factors in, dealing, in living in the world. Krishna consciousness is like an art, and I'm, I'm, I'm a, learning the art. Now, an artist, when he does his art, he has so many, you know, side little difficulties, but his life is the art. When he sees that somebody appreciates his art, that gives him great happiness. Why are you happy? This is Maharaj. He's a publisher. Uh, he's one of 13 spiritual masters or gurus in the entire world in the Krishna movement. About the issue of celibacy, what happens after marriage then? Well, after marriage, 
Of course, celibacy is only taught in our schools to the teenagers as a discipline. It's not obviously taught to young children. And there's no question of sex desire for young children. After marriage, we are taught from our ancient scriptures to see the sacredness of marriage and family life and to see sex also as a sacred act, an act of transmission of life, so that within the marriage, whenever there is sex, it is for the purpose of conceiving a child. And is that the only time then that there's sex? Well, because we respect sex as the transmission of life, whenever there is sex, we have to allow that to take place if it's God's will. There's no birth control in our religion. Maharaj, you're in our society, but in a sense you've stepped out of it into a world of your own. Do you take part in the political process? Do you pay taxes? Do you, are, are you like the rest of us there? Well, our congregational members who are private citizens obviously uh, pay taxes and participate in the society to a great extent. Those who live in our temples, in our ashrams, they're practicing a very uh, religious way of life. There are no taxes for religions in America, and we also... How many would that be? How well, in America, we have about 10,000 students who live in our ashrams at any given time. Mm -hmm. And the earnings that the, many of the people make uh, uh, and are part of the faith, they are contributed yes. all or part, or how does that go? Well, for our congregation, contributions are voluntary. There's no fixed tithing uh, percentage. I wonder about, uh, as Jerry did yesterday, I continue to today and probably tomorrow and the next day too, about children and indoctrinating them at an early age. And I wonder, I don't question an adult's ability to embrace this or their right to, but to make choices before a child's critical faculties are engaged at all. Well, we have two reasons why we send our children to our schools rather than the public schools. The first is to uh, protect them, actually, from peer pressures that might lead to drug abuse and um, alcoholism and and the, the problems that exist in the public schools. And as far as the uh, positive reason why we send our kids to our schools, we believe that schools should not only teach academics, but they should also teach a moral way of life, a spiritual development. So our teachers are trained to instruct and instill the children in both. Okay, thank you. I'm so sorry to interrupt. I know we just scratched the surface, so thank you very much. Tomorrow we're going to have scene. children here that you can ask maybe some direct questions okay. to you. Thanks very much, Bill. Tonight, Dr. William Rader reports on the first generation of children born into the Hare Krishna movement, and he's going to give us an exclusive look at a commune in Northern California where many of these children are being raised and trained to spread Krishna consciousness. Dr. Rader. Thanks, Anne. One of the most popular and established religious groups is the Hare Krishna movement. They believe that chanting the names of God will bring about social change on a worldwide scale, that there'll be no more hatred, no more suffering, and no more violence. The Krishna movement itself has been active in the United States for over 17 years. But now, for the first time, there are a new group of Krishna devotees, the children of Krishna. Many of the first generation of Hare Krishna children live in a commune that is in the foothills of the California Sequoia Mountains in a community called Three Rivers. The children begin each day at 4 in the morning. First, they apply a tallow clay mixture to their face to designate their body as a temple of God. Then they go to the temple to worship Lord Krishna. This is the first generation to be raised by the parents who belong to the International Society for Krishna Consciousness, a fundamentalist Hindu sect has become perhaps the most visible and therefore controversial New Age religion in the West. The children are trained to develop qualities of truthfulness, cleanliness, self-control, hard work, obedience to God, and ultimately to become devotees or servants of God. There are 25 Hare Krishna schools worldwide with approximately 2,000 students. The children attend classes four hours a day, six days a week, with Sundays off. They learn Sanskrit, Indian dance, and scripture studies, as well as reading, writing, and arithmetic, and other subjects taught in what they call the material world. The only difference is their total immersion in Lord Krishna. The 
Mrs. Montrini, Lalita, Tamahara, and Jairati. Uh, I guess what most people are wondering, uh, the children have been in the Krishna movement all their lives. Some people watching may feel that they, they really haven't been exposed to what other children have been. In, in, a, in, in a sense, maybe they feel they're even brainwashed because they haven't had that exposure. What? There's intoxication, um, illicit sex life, and so many things that children in these schools are exposed to that we feel that actually what we're giving them is an alternative, which is a God-conscious upbringing, upbringing, which is um, a very loving and very warm atmosphere. In this way, that I think that we're not actually sheltering them um, from anything that um, would be any, would be any difficulty. It's uh, like a plant growing. You have to give it the things that it needs to grow, the sunshine and the, and the water. But you keep it from the insects and the disease. And so that's what we feel we're doing. We're protecting our children. So when they do grow up and become members of society, then they can be strong. They won't be emotional cripples. But then, Trini, you say protecting your children. By doing that, and this follows up on Bill's question, you're really not offering them a choice, are you? Well, children have to be trained by their parents as their parents see fit. I mean, that's the role of a mother. Every mother wants to give her child the best thing. And this is our life, and we've chosen it, and our children are coming along with us. Now, when they grow up, they have their own individual lives, and they'll have to make their own choice. Do your children live with you in a single-family home? Yes, ours do. Yes. Is that common? Yes, actually, in our school uh, that you were seeing, about half of the children live um, with their parents or living on the community with them. And where do the other half live? Some of them live in Los Angeles and some of the other cities. No, but, when it, no, but what she's asking is that there are children who don't live with their parents, and I guess that's what you want yes. to know about. Yeah, that's right. Well, we yeah. don't have schools in uh, every, every town that we have a center in. We're a small movement at the, t at the time. And what we basically wanted to do in Los Angeles is get the children out of Los Angeles, the bad environment of the city away from the pollution and the smog and the bad influence of city life. So we bought a farm and we have a farm school and as you saw they have the cows and the country and the river and the clean air and the, and the clean water. And but so, not necessarily their parents living there with them. Well, the, half of the parents live there and work on the farm and help with the school. The other half have their work and service in Los Angeles. So they've chosen to send their children as a better alternative. It's not the best and we're working towards having the parents with the children. So the, the children don't get, uh, for instance, if the rest of the world is hung up on EP, your children won't be. But we do have Krishna Conscious Television now. Do we have Krishna yeah. Conscious Television, we have Krishna Conscious Movies, we have books, we have literature, they have dance, they have poetry, art. A lot of people think that you don't think for yourself. Are you free to say whatever you want? Yes. If you got angry at your mother, are you free to tell her that you're angry at her? Yes. Okay. You guys have any final questions before we wrap up? No, I think we're out of time, but uh, thank you all for, for being with us tonight. We're very glad to come. Okay. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving, also. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Okay.